So then, the story of the wise man, the story of mystery, it presents lots of questions to us, does it not? Where did they come from? We don't really know with absolute certainty. How many were there? We aren't really sure. Uh, how, did, uh, how did they know to follow the star? We're not told. They, they just seem to come mysteriously out of nowhere to pay homage to the newborn king and then just as mysteriously, they're gone. You hear no more about them. That's it. And yet they, pay, they play a, an integral part in this whole aspect of, of uh, the, uh, the birth of Christ and thereafter. And, uh, and the details are so important for us to actually look into and understand. So while our scripture doesn't give us all the details, tradition tells us a few things. Well, you can't be too sure about tradition. You know, sometimes those things just aren't right. Tradition gives their names as Gaspar and Melchor and, and Balthazar. Who knows, you know? So, uh, now you can breathe. <laughs> There you go. So, and, and look, I mean, supposedly they were kings. Well, if they were kings, we have no record anywhere of kings with those names. So tradition sort of like fell down there pretty quick. So these, these were wise men, by the way. They were wise men, also known as magi, and they were men belonging to a various educated classes. Our English word magician comes from the same root, but you know, that's the sort of thing, you know, sleight of hand and all that sort of stuff. That's got nothing to do with these guys. They went out there doing magic tricks. Okay, they were of noble birth. They were educated. They were wealthy, and they were influential. And they were most likely philosophers, counselors, or, ruler, or, or, or rulers. And they learned the wisdom of the ancient East. That's what they did. So they were very much respected within the society in which they lived. Some have even said that that, that the wise men who came seeking the Christ child were not just idolaters worshippers of other gods, that is, but they were actually upright men of integrity. That may well have been the case because they were seeking to find out this king, who he was. And so uh, the Magi, which is the plural of the Magi, uh, um, uh, you know, they were, they're described in, in the original language as men of wisdom who studied the stars. Uh, not, uh, not, uh, Astrology, uh, 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 astronomy, not astronomy, but astrology. You know, so that's that's you know that could be pushing it a little bit far because you know I, I don't think they they had the privilege of actually understanding the totality of of the things that, that was around there. But anyhow, the, a lot of this would have been influenced because if you go back to to when Israel, the, the Judah in particular, were exiled into to, to the east that they had a huge amount of influence and you know that's that's one of those things you go to the book of Esther and you see how far they were spread out from India all the way down to Ethiopia that's a fair whack of land isn't it where, 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 where the people of God were scattered did they influence the people around them at that time absolutely absolutely to the extent that you know God's word was being read regularly by those people, uh, and they lived in a distinctive way. There's clearly evidence that they had an influence in the societies from India to Ethiopia. You think about it, that's a big slab. So somewhere in the long, amongst that places over in the east, there, these guys came. Uh, anyhow. We, well, look at this, Daniel, the book of Daniel, for example. We're still in our introduction here, by the way. Um, <laughs> See, look at, we look at Daniel, for example. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 47 to, to 48, the king said to Daniel, Surely your God, this is after he interpreted the dream, your God is the God of, the God of gods. He is the Lord of kings, the revealer of mysteries, for you are able to reveal this mystery. Then the king placed Daniel in a high position and lavished many gifts on him. He made him the ruler of the entire province of Babylon and placed him in charge, got this, placed him in charge of the wise men. Daniel. 
think he might have said a thing or two to them while he was the guy who was in charge of the wise men. I'm sure he did. Absolutely. Israel were expecting the coming of the Messiah. And these men may well have been expecting it as well. To what extent we understand all that doesn't really matter, does it? The thing is, this morning we need to concentrate what we have here in the scriptures about what we're told. So let's just bow our heads and seek the Lord. Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your blessings. And for this passage of scripture, I pray that you might bring out to us these truths that we may, O oh Lord, appreciate your amazing sovereignty in all of our lives, but in all of history as well, and particularly through your dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He asked all these things in his name. Amen. Three things I'll look at. They were guided to Christ. They were given wisdom about Jesus Christ. And they worshipped and gave gifts to Jesus Christ. So Matthew starts off with, the, with his genealogy. We're just going back into chapter 1. It starts off the genealogy. Remember the first thing we looked at last week was, this is the book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, all about this line that had been already promised and prophesied. The son of David, the son of Abraham. He then tells us about the name of Mary and Joseph and this miraculous conception how to place by the Holy Spirit. And then with the, 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 the name that is given to the boy child, the name is Jesus or Yeshua, Joshua. And uh, we read in Matthew chapter 1 verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, shall bear a son, and they shall call him Emmanuel, which translates means God with us. We read that also from Isaiah the prophecy. Okay? And so we get to this, get, get to this section here. Straight away we see that they, that, that, then Matthew leaves that and he goes to this situation. He's the only one, the only gospel that mentions the, the, those wise men coming from the east. Now we move, so we move on we, to, to what takes place here after the birth of Jesus. Uh, and Joseph and Mary have moved from the, the stable in Bethlehem to a more permanent residence. Okay? You've got to see that, because when you get the Christmas card, you've got the, the wise men, all three of them, <laughs> and they're out there, and they're at that and they're saying, no, they weren't. So, sorry to say that, it clearly is not true. Uh, I mean, it's convenient, isn't it, to fit the whole package into one, it's all nice and everything, and it's, I suppose, a bit of poetic stuff there, but it's, it's just not accurate. So, they've come from the east, but we can be absolutely certain about where, you know, we can't be absolutely certain about where in the east, yeah, possibly Babylon, possibly Persia. As I said before, you know, we're, we're in the UAE and Oman, you know, where they have so much of this, this uh, you know, myrrh down there. I mean, well, you know, perhaps the gold came up from Yemen, the place of, of, of Queen, the Queen of Sheba. Uh, do we know? Arabia, you know, Midian, do we know where they came from? Well, we don't, do we? Did they come from different places? You know, did one come from here, this country, that country? They all met up on the way through to Jerusalem. Or they come from the same place? Anyhow, so that's the difficulty. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. That's what we're told. Not told from where? It's from the east. And so they had come from the east, and, uh, you know, the fact is, is that uh, they, they go, first of all, to Herod. Well, where else would you go? You'd go to the palace, wouldn't you? If there's to be a king born, that's the logical place to go. Okay? So they, they come into Jerusalem, and they follow the, the, the road signs, you know, Herod's palace. No, they, they don't, probably didn't have them. So they would have spoken to the people on the way through. You know, we're, we're here to find the newborn king, asking the people. People, the newborn king? It's a king born? You can hear, you can hear the, 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 the words getting around Jerusalem spreading out. You can hear it. You know, it's a king born. Maybe it's the Messiah. Okay, these guys have come because, you know, in relation to this. And so straight away there's a stir in Jerusalem. We know that. The passage tells us, and we'll read that in a second. And then, of course, they go, they find out where, where, where Herod's, uh, Herod's uh, past palace is, and uh, they go to, go to Herod. And, uh, but, you know, it couldn't have been, it couldn't have been Herod. No, no, but this, this child that was born couldn't have been of Herod, because, well, Herod had nothing to do with the line of David. 
nothing at all. He wasn't even an Israelite. Yet they go to him and ask, where is the one who is to be born king of the Jews? Now they know the king had been born, for they saw his star. We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. So notice what it says, we saw his star. You got that one? His star. Now this is important. Okay. It was a star that was set in place by God to show those of the world, by these wise men as well, that God had sent his son as king of Israel, and these fellows would highlight this truth. Okay. So therefore the star they saw was unique in nature and was obvious to these wise men. It was obvious to them. I mean, after all, you don't go wandering around looking for stars moving, tend to, you know, they don't tend to move, do they? They might twinkle, twinkle. <laughs> they don't movie, movie. <laughs> that's, a, that's a bit of a unique sort of a thing, isn't it? You know? So here we go. These guys had noticed this and obvi it was obvious to them. They followed it and it was moving. Now, it's at this point that many have presuppositions and conjecture about, well, maybe it was, a, maybe it was this or maybe it was that. And, you know, I had an elder send me an email a few years ago and, uh, and it was about a comet that he'd been reading about because he was pretty much into, uh, into science and, uh, and uh, all that sort of stuff. And uh, he was just, it, it, fairly much wrapped and convinced that this is what it was. This is a comet that only appears every couple of thousand years and, and so therefore it must have, been, must have been this. And I said, I replied and I said, well, the world is always trying to take away from Christ by explaining, trying to explain, the, 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 you know, trying to explain away the miraculous aspect of, of, of his birth. They do it. You know, they do the same with the Virgin Mary. Oh, that didn't happen. You know, it must have been Roman soldier or whatever. So, so I, I replied to him. So, you know, they're trying to explain away the miraculous star. And, and you know, he thought, well, well, God could use a comet. Well, I guess God could use a comet if he wanted to. It doesn't say that in the scriptures. We saw his star. Okay. So I asked him, can comets stop? Can they stop? Can they stop? <laughs> Take off again. No, he said. I said, well, it wasn't a comet, then, was it? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, so verse nine, and they, and after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. It stopped. Stars don't move and stop and move and stop. It stopped. And I reaffirmed to him that the world is always trying to take away from Christ by trying to explain away the miraculous star or the miraculous birth or whatever it is of the Messiah. They're always trying to demean the Christ. And that's a truism that'll ring true until the end of history. They're always trying to undermine the truth of God's word and the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, his existence here on earth, his death. His, 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 his burial, his resurrection. They try to demean all those things, take away from it because they don't believe what God has done. Okay, we're here today because we do. So it's no small thing. That we don't treat this lightly. This star that had captured the attention of these wise men caused them to load up their camels and head west to Jerusalem. It would have taken them a long time to get from where they were, even if it was just over in Babylon, which doesn't seem very far on the map, but, you know, camel-wise, it's still a fair whack. Uh, you know, from, from the east, somewhere wherever they came, it would have taken them a long time to get to Jerusalem. So therefore, the star must have moved slowly enough for them to follow. Okay? And when they got to Jerusalem, the star did not keep moving on no, 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 it did not. It waited for them. And Herod, the Roman appointed king, says, where is the one, he asked, they asked him, where is the one that, that has been born king of the Jews? They went there specifically to find out, thinking he might know. Well, you know, now this is not a small thing, by the way, in the scriptures. 
This is so important that this was recorded. We have three foreigners, they slip, they split, trip into Jerusalem and rock up to the palace and they are inquired after a baby, you know, who's the king of the Jews. Really, that's, that's not how it works. You know, three guys on camels wouldn't even be noticed. They wouldn't even be noticed at this time of year when there was a census taking place. No one would even lift an eyebrow. No, this was a train of camels. A train of camels. And, and, and the fact is that, that, that uh, it wasn't just three men that travelled by themselves. When you think of the logic of that, you know, here they're carrying gold and frankincense and myrrh. They're valuable items. They would get desert whacked. Well, bushwhacked here, but desert whacked. Okay? They wouldn't have made it with all those valuables. No, they had a train of them. Think about the fact they were so journey from the east. And you can you can you can probably get from you know Townsville down to, to Nambour in a day if you if you drive. Think about that Lex you did it the other day. There you go, see, it's possible. Lex survived. So, but you try that on camels. It's a journey. You go so far, you unpack, you put up your tents, you know, you cook your meals, you've got to do all that sort of thing, and you bunker down for the night, and the next day you pack up everything, you put them on your camels, and you go forward a few more miles, and that's what happens. It takes a long time. It's called so journey. So journey. It takes a long time. And, and, and you don't do that by yourself, all right? You have, you have a train, you have servants, you have food, you have, you have all those necessary things that you need to do that journey, okay? So this was not some small thing, plus the fact they had valuable gifts with them, they probably you know, went to communities along the way, restocked and all that sort of thing. They knew where they were going. They sojourned and they finally got into Jerusalem. Well. How do we know? Well, the passage tells us, verse 3, when, Herod, when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. Now, so, so here's all Jerusalem. They've seen this train of events coming into Jerusalem. They've seen it happen. They're going, what's going on here? As I said, went to three guys slipping into Jerusalem. <coughs> As these men travel through Jerusalem with their lives coming, people are wondering what this all means. Word starts to spread. And they've come to seek out the newborn king. So Herod, Herod gathers his scholars, his chief priests, his scribes to find out where the Messiah king is born. And these ones tell Herod, well, in Bethlehem, Judea, they reply. For this is what the prophet has written. You, Bethlehem, the land of Judea, the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people. Okay, verses 5 and 6. It is at this point that we are introduced to the diabolical plot that is to follow. We're introduced to that diabolical plot that Herod was scheming. And he was a scheme. Verses 7 and 8. Then Herod called the Magi to himself secretly and found out from them the exact, the exact time the star had appeared. And if we were to go on in the passage, when the slaughter of the innocents, the children, is called the slaughter of the innocents, the slaughter of the, of, the, of the children up to three years of age. Yeah, so he allowed it. So you've got an idea of the picture of time here now, how long it took for them to travel from the east over to Jerusalem. It took them a long time. And Herod called them to him and they found out at the exact time the star appeared, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, now go and make a careful search for the child and as soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may worship him. Worship him? Worship him? No. Murder him? Yeah. That's what he meant, wasn't it? That's what he meant. But this child was no ordinary child. He was God's child. And God would not allow any harm to come to him at all. And so then the important thing for us to remember about these wise men is, is that they were moved by God to go and seek out the one to whom he is leading them to. As well as for this, for us to realise that they were ready to go. They were more than ready to go. It wasn't just a, 
a, a thing that go, oh, look at that, there's a star moving, and all sit around and contemplate. They knew about this somehow beforehand. So God had prepared even these people in the East in relation to the coming of the Messiah. And they were, they were ready to go. They were ready to pack up all they had, and they took their gifts because they knew that this was something incredibly important. And they would follow wherever God might lead them. What a message for us. What a message for us always. Is is that God is the sovereign Lord over all things. And if we really want to follow Him as we should, we should always be prepared to do what He wants us to do. Even sometimes if it's uncomfortable to serve Him. All right? We need to be mindful if we, be if we belong to the Lord Jesus. That, you know, that he can use us in ways that maybe, you know, we would never have thought of before. Now, now think about this as well. When they went over to Jerusalem, and then into Bethlehem, and they gave their gifts, and then they went back home after all that time, that they, by the time they got back. Just think about that on top of it. Consider how God's purpose back in their own country, from where they came, what they would take back to those people, what they saw. Think about that. So as they go back to their countries, they take this news about the king who is born. And then in those countries, the gospel message, when it goes over there, has already had the foundation laid. Because God would prepare them for the coming of the gospel. Isn't that amazing? And that's it. When you think about that, it wasn't a shock to many of those places when they heard about the Christ who had been born because, you know, that information had already spread out through those regions. So what can we learn from this? Well, God may not lead us in quite as dramatic way. Hopefully you won't have to pack up your camel. <laughs> the car's a bit easier. But certainly this, God promises to lead us always. He promises to lead us every day. All right, that's what he promises. What he asks us to do is to trust him. To trust in the Lord with all of our heart. And you know what? That's not as easy as it sounds. And we don't always do that. We don't always trust him. We don't know what tomorrow holds or next week or, or next year. But to trust him emphatically. To follow him. And he knows that when we are in his hands, he does lead and he will, he will guide each step that we take as we trust him. So, okay, then we move on. Verse 10. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed on coming to the house, the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and they worshipped him. What a beautiful picture. Here they go to the house where Mary and Joseph are now staying. And there they see Mary with the babe. And the first thing they do, when ask about the child, they bow down and they worship him. Why? Because the star had stopped at the top of that house. There it is. God points to it, the bright light. They go, wow, they've come all this way. The anticipation, the excitement. The humility of God taking them to meet the King of Israel. And they bow down and they worship him. Not just pay homage, they worship him. Okay? There's something that's happened in their life as well. And so then the important thing is for us to look at this, and we see it here, is that when the, the guiding star finally stopped, they look to see. And they beheld, they beheld, and they were overjoyed with this opportunity to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Overjoyed. So the journey was over. They'd been led by God's miraculous star to the very place where the King of Israel was now living at that time. Verse 11, on coming to the house, they saw the child, as I said, uh, with his mother Mary. So we we could consider what the difference well, you know, what was different about Jesus and, and other babies at his age and all that sort of stuff. And, and you know, 
I mean, you know, one of the one of the carols we sing is is that you know he wakes and no child, no no crying he makes because he's a good kid and I mean let's face it, good babies don't cry, do they ever? Oh, rubbish. Anyhow, so, he, he was you know he was just he was a child. What was he? You know, he was a babe or he was a young child. We don't know exactly. He might have been a toddler by this stage, but he was he was there, okay, and he was he was doing what young children do, growing up. The thing is, is that when the Magi saw Jesus, they knew that he was the child. They knew it. They knew that he was the one that they had been guided to. And, 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 and that's the, that guiding wisdom from God to get them to the Messiah revealed to them that this, this, this Christ, this, this Christ child, was the one to be worshipped. They bowed down and worshipped him. So what can we learn? What can we learn from this? Well, many people every day are being led to an understanding of who Jesus really is. All around the world. Thankful for that. Okay, we may not see... We know, you know, when we've come to Christ, we don't get to see Him physically. Some people have dreams and visions and all sorts of things. We understand that. But, you know, it'll be, it'll be one of those things. We, we don't get to see Him physically. Okay? And, um, you know... What do we say about that? Well, Jesus has already dealt with this for us, hasn't he? After his crucifixion, you remember, he appeared in the upper room with his disciples. And dear Thomas was not there. So later on he appears when Thomas is there. And he tells Thomas, you know, put your hand in the scar holes in my side and the hole there. And Thomas, Thomas just fell down before Jesus. He says, my Lord and my God. The words of Jesus. Ring, ring to us. Because you have seen, Thomas, you have believed. Blessed are they who did not see and yet have believed. That's you, isn't it? Isn't that you? Blessed are they who did not see and yet have believed. That is you. You're blessed. Because God has put a faith in your heart to enable you to see what Christ has done. So the world, the world may not see this, and it may, it may, uh, it may be, you know, blind to those things. But uh, you know, the wise men, they they try to judge them according to worldly standards. But I think we should judge them according to God's standards because He was the one who rallied them to that point. We need to understand from a different perspective. And the other thing is, is that the Bible still says that uh, of the people of the world, as much as they might try and understand these things, that they really are a fool in their heart. You know, that's what, that's what the scripture tells us. The, 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 because they don't believe. You know, the fool has said in his heart, well, there is no God at all. They just don't believe or they have difficulty there. The truly wise men still come seeking the Messiah. The truly wise ones keep seeking the Messiah, the King of Israel, for they are wiser than the men of this world. Blessed are they who did not see yet believed. And then finally, we look at these last verses, a couple last verses here, verses 11 and 12. And uh, so people, people are worshipping lots of different things today, sadly. Uh, we were down the road the other day, my dear wife was getting some pots at the neighbourhood centre, is that what you call it, what it is down the road there, a little bit cheaper, and she was stocking up on pots. And there's this guy came out and he had this whopping big poster of Shiva. Oh. I thought, oh, you idiot. <laughs> I honestly thought that. So, you know, that's the fancy, I'm sorry. But I thought, fancy carrying that thing home with you. That's so sad. So this is your goddess, you're going to stick it up the wall. And, uh, it's just, you know, whatever, for whatever reason, you know, it just doesn't seem that the world today is taking the Lord God, seriously, they'll look everywhere else. So, people worship lots of things. Some are worshipping men, others are worshipping things. Lots of worshipping going the wrong things. But the wise men came to worship Christ the King, the newborn King. So these wise men were from a pagan world around them, where the stars and the pagan gods were worshipped. And they were religious, sincere men of wealth, prestige, power, yet they, got, they, were, they were guided by God to the Christ child and they worshipped him. They worshipped him. And the wise men bought the gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. These gifts 
have given rise to lots of speculation about symbolism of these gifts. Gold represents wealth, obviously. Solomon sat on an ivory throne that was inlaid with gold. Solomon's temple was plated with gold. We read of the golden streets in heaven. And obviously gold represents wealth for the new king. So granted that he was born on a lowly estate, okay, he died in our place in the most detestable way. You kind of think that gold doesn't really fit our king. Yes, it does. You know why? This earth belongs to God. The world, its wealth, and all its people. He did come to the sin-cursed world, but he did not come to the sin-cursed world to become rich. Sorry for you folk out there who think that that's how it should be. But he didn't come to this world to become rich. He came to this world to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what he came for. To save his people from their sins as we saw last Sunday night. Then frankincense, which is derived by cutting a slit into the bark of an Arabian tree. The yellow sap is quite an agreeable fragrance. It's hardened and used as incense in worship. So these frankincense, the frankincense represents worship. Worship of the new king, worship of the son of God. Then myrrh, well myrrh comes from stunted trees. It's a brown fragrant uh, perfume. It's used to anoint dead bodies. Dead bodies, yeah, to embalm and preserve them. Myrrh represents the purpose of why Jesus had to be born. His eternal, the eternal Son of God took on the flesh of man so that he could die upon the cross for us. That, this, is, this, is, this is what Christmas is about. The celebration of Christ is about the one who comes to save us. You know, even, even in his birth, Jesus was being set aside for the suffering and the vicarious death that he would die for us, even in his birth. No, that, that's no small thing. His purpose was to die for us. To die for us. Wealth, worship and work. Gold, frankincense and myrrh. These were the gifts that the wise men from the east were led by God, were led by God to bring to him and give to that newborn king of Israel. And they gave these gifts to express their adoration and worship. And I could take it from there and say, well, what gifts can you bring to God and all this sort of stuff. Now that, that was the point in time when he was recognised and prepared for that whole journey ahead of him down to Egypt. <coughs> down into Egypt to escape the tyranny of the murderous Herod. It was at that point, here, that those men from the east prepared him for that and prepared Herod for his murderous task to identify that one who was born in Bethlehem, the only one who survived, the only one who survived of that age group. Jesus was indeed unique from Bethlehem. There was not another one of his age from Bethlehem. Think about it. So what we can learn in this passage, and I think it is obvious, and that is, is that first of all, worship. We, we, we truly should be worshipping Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Saviour. And then the Bible clearly tells us that Jesus, or Yeshua the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, He is the only way. There is no other way. God has never given us another way. He is the only way, the truth and the life that takes us to God in heaven. But we have to trust Him, believe in Him, and humbly bow before Him and worship Him. So when it comes to, when it comes to worship Christ Jesus, when we come to worship Him, we come to the King of all kings. We come to the Lord of all lords. And we bow down. Humbly and worship Him. And we should, we should, we've been set a marvellous example by these, these uh, wise men from the, from the East. We worship Him today, we worship Him tomorrow, we worship Him every day. And if we're in the Lord Jesus Christ, we worship Him for eternity.
take that with you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much. You are a loving, merciful and gracious God. We are such a sad people at times, but we are so blessed because of all that you've done. And Lord, this day, as we set about to go our way, spend time with family, friends, loved ones, celebrate, oh Lord, may it be a, a, a thing in our hearts that we are here today because you've made it all possible we are eternally blessed because you have brought us into your presence. We have a Saviour, and only one Saviour who can bring us into your presence. We thank you so much. So Lord, go with us each one as we worship you now and as we go from here and every day as an act of worship to you, our living God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing 192. Though you reign on high with kingly crown, but you came down to birth for me. In Bethlehem's home there was found a room for your holy nativity. Jesus, name above all men. <laughs> 